Hi, welcome to this quick video review on DVT ultrasound. Remember that you should always have a differential diagnosis. It could be cellulitis or abscess, or it could be systemic congestion from either high hydrostatic pressure as in heart failure, or low oncotic pressure as in hypoalbuminemia in our liver patients. And this is kind of what it looks like. You have cobblestoning of the subcutaneous space right here. You have uh, fluid between these fat globules, um, and it's pretty typical of both a cellulitis as well as systemic congestion. You also have lymph adenopathy, and it typically manifests as something that looks like it could be a clot, but it's actually pretty discreet and spherical. So if it goes away uh, and you still have your vessels here, then you know that uh, that was just a lymph node. You also have a ruptured Baker cyst. So this is pretty obvious that this isn't a vein. You can also put color Doppler on just to make sure there's no flow. And this is typically what it looks like. Uh, and it's also only in the popliteal region. Then you have your superficial venous thrombosis, which shouldn't affect your DVT ultrasound and is more likely a clinical diagnosis. And then you have your muscle hematoma or myositis, where you actually have uh, fluid along the actual fibers of the muscle and I'll play it again so there's fluid right here it's actually in this subcutaneous space it's actually along the, the muscle fibers themselves and last if you had like a Achilles tendon injury of some sort this is actually a biceps tear but it gives you the same idea where the muscle fibers or tendon fibers are actually disrupted and you can notice that it's typically pretty close to the the bone itself so it's not anywhere near any vascular structures. Uh, this is going from a long axis to a short axis view right here. So this is the torn fiber and then there's a lot of fluid around there. So those should be on your differential for DVT. Briefly the anatomy, so you want to start off at the saphenofemoral junction where the great saphenous vein takes off. The reason is that even though the, the saphenous vein is not considered a, a deep vein, if you actually had a clot right here, the risk of embolism is still uh, rather high. Then you have your common femoral vein and it will about two or three centimeters uh, distal it will bifurcate into your deep femoral vein and your superficial femoral vein. This is actually a misnomer. Your superficial femoral vein is the one that actually dives posteriorly to become your popliteal vein whereas your deep femoral vein actually just divides into the little tiny veins that supply the, the lateral thigh. So again, your superficial femoral vein is the one that actually becomes your popliteal vein. And it does this by diving posteriorly into the adductor canal where it travels, as highlighted in the blue section right here. And it's in this segment that where you, if you have someone that has a lot of soft tissue, it becomes very difficult to evaluate for a deep venous thrombosis. So your popliteal vein travels posteriorly posterior to the popliteal arteries. So on a posterior ultrasound when you're evaluating the popliteal crease, it'll appear to be superficial to the popliteal artery. And this popliteal vein makes two bifurcations. The first one is the bifurcation into the anterior tibial vein, so then it'll actually travel deep on the posterior ultrasound. And then next, it'll bifurcate again into the posterior tibial vein and the fibular or peroneal vein. It's after the segment as highlighted in the blue that we consider uh, the veins calf veins. And these calf veins are difficult to evaluate as well as the prior segment of the femoral vein highlighted in blue because the, the calf veins themselves are really small and it becomes harder to evaluate for clot. Keep in mind that most of your DVTs are actually going to be in the common femoral vein distribution about three quarters of the time. Less than 5% is actually going to be in this hard to evaluate spot and then the remaining 20 to 25% are going to be along this popliteal area before the bifurcation or trifurcation into the calf veins. The calf veins are only responsible for about 5% of DVTs or less. So these areas, this especially calf vein, we, we call those segmental areas uh, along with this right here and the reason is that uh, we can't evaluate these segments very well and there is a risk of thrombosis and a risk of extension of the clot but and we'll talk about that in a second so what is your your diagnostic criteria for DVT the, f the main
criteria is whether the vein is compressible or not. If it's non-compressible, there's nothing else you need to do. This person has a DVT. Now, what are secondary diagnostic criteria? You can image the thrombus, which is um, harder to do in an acute DVT because it's less echogenic. And you can also assess for venous distension, but uh, you could have venous insufficiency or valvular dysfunction causing the same thing, so it's not specific. You can assess for a filling defect. You could put color Doppler on and see if there's any filling defect, uh, but it, it's neither sensitive or specific for a DVT. And you can look for uh, loss of augmentation, which we'll get to in a second, as well as uh, respiratory variation or with Valsalva, which also we'll, we'll talk about. So what's the difference between a formal slash radiology performed DVT ultrasound and an emergency department or emergency physician performed DVT ultrasound? The first is that uh, we don't typically do a long axis view of the vein. You typically would want to do one if you saw a DVT and you want to see how far that clot extended. Or if you had a chronic DVT, let's say a patient has a history of a, of a DVT from a month ago, and you want to see if the clot has actually extended uh, and you have like a previous measurement, then you, then you could do a long axis and, and kind of measure out that clot. The second thing that we typically don't do is a color Doppler, and what that does is it helps you to assess for filling defect. Sometimes when you're having trouble finding where the vein is, usually your popliteal vein, it's, it's a good idea to put color Doppler on, and then that way you can assess whether that is a vessel of interest. Another thing that we don't typically do is augmentation, and what augmentation does along with color Doppler is it helps you to visualize a clot if it's there. The idea behind augmentation is that you have this long vein, you apply pressure right here distally, and that should actually cause increased venous return. And if you put the probe right here, you would actually see an increase in flow on color Doppler. Now, if there's a big obstructive clot, you won't see that, or you'll see the filling defect. Now, if you had a smaller clot, you may actually not see any change with augmentation. The last and the most important difference is time. So a formal DVT ultrasound will take close to half an hour to an hour to perform because they're doing all these other things that you don't need to do. Whereas a, a DVT ultrasound performed by emergency physicians could take less than five minutes to perform. You save about two hours on a patient's length of stay. And it's pretty good too, actually. Uh, compared to radiology performed ultrasound, it has greater than 95% sensitivity and specificity. Keep in mind that there are uh, studies that, that advocate for two-point DVT ultrasound, which means just two-point compression versus three-point compression versus just trying to look at those proximal areas, uh, not the segmental areas that we talked about. But in any of those techniques, you have high sensitivity and specificity. The last point in terms of ED performed DVT ultrasound is that it's actually pretty straightforward and very simple to do. Uh, the studies that look at how long it takes to train residents as well as attendings to do DVT ultrasound, it's actually about a few hours of training, and as few as 10 DVT exams will lead you to competency. So what are some pearls to DVT ultrasound? First, make sure to expose your patient. Sometimes because it involves the groin area or the lower extremity, some people get bashful, but remember that uh, you're really trying to rule out a life-threatening diagnosis. And if you counterweight it with all the patients that we do pelvic exams on because they have lower abdominal pain, um, you get the idea that we should be exposing our patients for DVT ultrasound. You also need to touch the patient, meaning you can't just use the probe to compress without actually anchoring the probe with the other hand onto the patient's skin. Or if you have a large patient, you need to use your other hand to lift that panis uh, off so that you can actually do adequate compression. This image actually shows you why it's flawed. So when you try to do that, remember that you have all this, this gel on the probe. So when you try to compress, you typically slide around and you're not able to evaluate fully if there's compressibility. So that's why you should actually do a two-handed approach. And what I mean by that is you have one hand, this hand, your right or left hand, tethered to the patient's skin so you know the probe's not moving. And then you have the other hand actually do the compression. This helps ensure that you're not giving undue uh, pressure and unintended compression of, of your vein.
typically with your popliteal vein, it can easily compress like this way. So make sure you expose your patient, make sure you do a two-handed approach. And when you compress, you really want to just compress perpendicularly. If you're off axis a little bit, you may be not imaging the same area that you're compressing. And also, uh, your vein ap typically appears to be more echogenic or more visible when you actually are imaging a plane perpendicular to the vein itself. You want to compress in one to two centimeter intervals. And if you have someone who's difficult, you can try to use Doppler. And you can also do a reverse Trendelenburg so that the blood is pulled in those veins and it makes those veins easier to see. So this is augmentation right here. You're squeezing the, the venous circulation distal to where you're trying to examine. And you put the probe right here into the femoral area. And uh, when you squeeze, this is what a normal should be right here where you don't see any filling defects. That's a normal uh, augmentation study. And then this is an, an abnormal study where you actually s see a filling defect in the center. So that points towards uh, a clot. So in terms of technique, you first want to expose a patient this way. Have the patient externally rotate like a frog leg. That helps you to expose a vein along the inguinal cr uh, crease. And you start about right there in the midline. And you should identify that saphenol femoral junction first, right here. Then uh, you go one centimeter, compress your common femoral vein. Then you do another couple of centimeters until you hit that superficial and deep femoral vein right here. And you want to try to compress until you lose that, that superficial femoral vein. And this is what a normal study looks like. Again, you have that, that saphenol femoral junction right there. You go again, there's no lymph node. You compress them one more time, still compressible. You could see the bifurcation into the superficial and deep right here, femoral vein, and try to compress one more time. And that should be an adequate femoral vein DVT ultrasound. This is a superficial femoral vein DVT right here. Notice that it doesn't compress. And you could see that maybe there's some echogenic material in here, but um, remember that the main criteria is that it's non-compressible right here. So your popliteal vein, some people advocate having the patient dangle their legs down or flex with the sole on the bed itself. I actually like having the patients lay prone or lateral decubitus because that opens up this area for you so that you can identify the popliteal vein with ease. And also, you can do your perpendicular compression. So just go, about, just go above the popliteal fossa right here, and you should... Identify about right here, do the compression, go about one centimeter, do another compression. You'll probably see a bifurcation for, into the anterior tubular vein. And then go again, and then you'll see the bifurcation again of, of the fibular or peroneal vein and the posterior tubular vein. And you're done. So this is a normal, this is your popliteal vein right here. Remember that popliteal vein is posterior to the artery, so it's more superficial on a posterior ultrasound and you're just compressing until you have that bifurcation to the calf veins. So this is your popliteal DVT right here. This is the artery. It's pulsating, but the, DV, the, the popliteal vein doesn't compress. So you have a, a popliteal DVT right here. So the difference between a proximal versus segmental DVT is in the location and also the yield. So segmental DVTs are harder to ultrasound, but they also have a uh, very low yield. Uh, remember that your segmental DVT is usually distal to the popliteal vein um, when it when you have trifurcation to your calf veins and also some people like me consider your superficial femoral vein where it dives into the adductor canal before it merges posteriorly to be your popliteal vein so why is it low yield well there's only about a, a 20 percent chance that a segmental dvt will actually propagate um, into a proximal dvt and usually that takes about a week to two weeks. And even when it propagates to become a proximal DVT, there's only about a 25% chance that it will embolize to become a PE. So you're really looking at a 5% chance of a segmental DVT, even if you miss it, uh, causing something that's life-threatening. Second, in a, a pretty large study that was published in JAMA not too long ago, looked at all these patients had normal DVT scans and they followed them for three months. And your risk of actually having a proximal DVT from a segmental DVT is less than 1%. Now, if you have someone who's intermediate or high risk, let's say they have 
unilateral leg swelling and you can't figure out why, or they have a history of cancer or repeat DVTs, but you have a negative DVT study, either you can do a D-dimer and if it's negative, you can rule them out that way, or you can have them come back in about seven to 10 days for a repeat ultrasound. So some frequently asked questions, one, how much compression should I need? So if you actually see that artery compress a little bit, then you know that you have enough compression to compress the vein. And if that vein still doesn't compress, then that's a DVT. Second, when should you obtain a longitudinal view? So the only reason you would do that is if you want to evaluate the extent of a thrombus, if you have a DVT, or if you have uh, a chronic DVT and you want to figure out like if there's any resolution. Third, does color Doppler add to the study? No, not really. Um, only if you are having trouble identifying the veins. And the other thing is with augmentation, it, it may help. But again, that's not part of your limited DVT study. The other question is, should you ultrasound the contralateral leg, especially if it's asymptomatic? The answer is no, because even with risk factors and a DVT in the other leg, you still have only less than a 10 to 15% chance of having bilateral DVT plus the management doesn't change. So if you perform a bedside DVT study, do you still need to order a formal study? That really depends on two things. It depends on whether your attending is credentialed to do bedside ultrasound, and it's also comfortable with their DVT study. And it also depends on whether the emergency department regularly bills or has an agreement with radiology to allow for bedside ultrasound. Now, if the policy is that you can perform a bedside DVT ultrasound, but you need to get a formal DVT ultrasound, then you should follow that policy. But remember that a lot of emergency departments in the country actually do their own DVT ultrasounds and bill for them without actually having to order a, a follow-up formal study. If you actually are going to do that, you need to do two things. First, you need to do the ultrasound and record it. And second, you need to be able to write that interpretation in the notes because both components are required as part of the quality improvement process as well as for billing. So typically iliac vein thrombosis uh, pregnancy is a risk factor for this. The reason is that uh, when you have a gravid uterus in the third trimester, the right iliac artery tends to compress that left iliac vein right here. This is called May Thurner syndrome and this is the reason why most uh, iliac vein thromboses occur in the left iliac vein. And, and because you can't compress the iliac vein, especially during the third trimester, you need to look for secondary signs of a possible thrombosis. Such as uh, change with respiratory variation. So this is a, a pulse wave Doppler on a superficial femoral vein, where whenever you take a breath, you increase venous turn and, and your, your flow increases. And then when you, when you exhale, it decreases. So you should, this is normal. So if you actually had an iliac vein thrombosis, you would lose this respiratory variation or facicity. Now, if you really were suspicious about iliac vein thrombosis, you would have to pursue an MRI. So the ultimate message for you guys is do it. It's really easy to do. It's highly accurate. And you can save your patients a lot of time by doing your own DVT ultrasound. Here are some references. Definitely take a look at these. Uh, they're, they're definitely very high yield reading. Thanks again for listening and uh, let me know if you have any questions.